Hey everybody. Uh, so in this video we're going to talk about social exclusion. So let's first talk about the need to belong. Now, why, what is the need to belong? Well, the need to belong uh, is the need to affiliate with others. Okay, so, uh, you know, to what extent do we want to belong to groups? Do we want to have friends? Do we want to have social context in general? Contacts in general. Um, now, people vary in how much they need to belong, but everybody has some need to belong. Everybody wants to have some social connection. Okay, now why is that? Why is it that we all have this need? Well, if you look at humans, we're not terribly formidable. We're not terribly impressive. I mean, we have we, we make great big things, and we're 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 an incredibly clever species. But if you look at our at, at, at the human individual, we're not terribly impressive. I mean, we we have no natural weapons, and the closest thing we have is a fist. But they're freaking fragile. All right, so um, our jaws don't open up wide enough to use our teeth as weapons. Our nails aren't strong enough to be used as weapons. We we don't have any natural weapons. All right, so if you put us up against a predator. All right, we're going to be up a creek. I mean, I know I can hear people say, well, not if I have a gun. And you're right. If you had a gun, you're probably fairly safe. Uh, I don't know, maybe. Um, tigers are fast, man. Uh, but um, even with, put guns aside, because for the majority of our evolutionary history, we didn't have guns. All right, and in fact, the best we probably had was a spear. Um, or, or a stone knife. So you put even a skilled combatant up against a tiger with a stone knife, you're done. <laughs> All right, I can't imagine even Bruce Lee going up against a tiger and winning. <laughs> okay, so um, I, unless you have a gun, but again, guns are irrelevant because they, they they weren't here for the majority of our history. Okay, so for the majority of our history, why what would have been the safest thing for humans to do? Well, to stay in a group. So much so that if you were kicked out of that group, that's tantamount to a death sentence. All right? You might as well say that you're being killed. And indeed, social exclusion feels bad. It hurts. And what's really cool to me is that there's some evidence that it actually hurts, or at least our brain treats it as if it actually hurts. But let's talk about that in a little bit. First, let's talk about how we study this. Well, uh, in all honesty, we are a little maniacal. I don't think anybody who studies ostracism or social exclusion enjoys hurting other people's feelings, but it's important to understand this mechanism so that we can, you know, uh, uh, remedy it or offer potential remedies. Okay? Now, how do we study it? Well, one way that's been used quite a bit is the ball throwing test. So we have a participant come in, we have two confederates come in, uh, Confederates are people that work for the experimenter, but they pose as other participants, and we just have them throw a ball to one another. So we have three people, two Confederates, and the participants throw, just throwing a ball to one another. And for those in an accepted condition, they always get the ball. You know, the Confederates always throw the ball to them. But for those in the rejected condition, after a little while, so the Confederates stop throwing the ball to them. So they, they start throwing the ball to them at the very beginning, but after a little bit, they quit. So they reject them. Um, and then we measure, you know, their their mood, their uh, self state, self esteem, uh, to what extent they're distressed after that. And lo and behold, people in the accepted conditions are always distressed less than the people in the rejected conditions. Now, this has been somewhat modernized, so now we have the cyberball throwing task, but it's essentially the same thing, but instead of seeing two real confederates, you see two avatars. Now you're told that two people are controlling those avatars from other uh, locations, uh, and then basically the whole thing proceeds as it did in a the in-person version of the task. All right, so the avid, for the first part of the task in the rejected condition, the participant is getting thrown the ball, but again in the rejection condition, after a bit, they get they they the confederates or the the two avatars in the in the cyberball case of the cyberball task quit throwing the ball to. Uh, the participant. Now, again, one of the advantages of the cyberball test is you don't actually need two confederates, all right? Because you can just program the system to either reject them eventually or to not. So it has an advantage to it. But some people might think, well, that's not going to be as strong as a, a strong a, a, manipula a manipulation of rejection. But actually, it is just as effective. So. Um, we use tasks like this 
to reject them, and then we measure, like I mentioned, their mood, their uh, state self-esteem, and you know, in general, we we have we have measurements of how distressed they are by that rejection. Now, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, there's some evidence that when we say that social exclusion hurts, we mean that for our brain at least, that's literal. Okay. Now again, our brain is us, so there's some evidence now that we, our brains, process social exclusion the same way that we process physical pain. Now, pain is distributed through the brain, meaning there's no real pain center in the brain. Um, but there are some areas that are associated with different aspects. So, for example, the anterior cingulate cortex is associated with the distress component of pain. So, you know, in uh, squirrel monkey infants, if you disable or in some way interfere with the activity of the anterior cingulate cortex, you get less separation crying, meaning you know, when the mother leaves, they don't cry as much to try and get the mother back. Um, and in humans, uh, human uh, mother's ACC, anterior cingulate cortex, um, becomes more active when they hear the crying of an infant. So, the ACC is involved in the, or at least there's evidence to suggest that it's involved in distress, okay? Another area known as the uh, right ventral prefrontal cortex is believed to be associated with the regulation of pain. So when you see increased activity, you see improvement on uh, pain symptoms. So greater activity in the RV, RVPFC, less pain. Okay. So there's some evidence uh, that <clears throat> the RVPFC regulates pain. Well, uh, some work by Eisenberger and colleagues found that when they had participants in an fMRI machine, and performing that cyberball task, when they were rejected, there was greater activity uh, in the ACC, and when there was greater activity in the RV PFC, there was diminished activity in the ACC. Okay, so they found evidence that the RV PFC was involved in regulating pain, and the ACC was involved in the experience of, or the distress experience of pain. Okay, so there's some evidence that our social exclusion processing system shares neurobiological substrates with our physical pain processing system. Okay, so when we say that social exclusion hurts, we might as well say that it literally hurts, because as far as your brain's concerned, it's almost the same thing. Um, now, obviously, there are, they don't share all the same components. There are many other components of pain that social exclusion don't use, but um, of the processing systems, social exclusion seems to share many of the same as pain. Okay. Now, um, you probably know people who say, "Well, I don't care about being excluded. I'm a lone wolf, man. I'm a, I'm a, I'm an island. All right, because you've heard that expression of something like a man is an island, or a man should be an island, or something like that. Anyway." Um, people, some people like to say or think that they're more independent than others, um, and certainly some people will will kind of act in a way that seems like they want to be more independent. For example, people have avoidant um, attachment styles. Okay, but even these individuals appear to like being included. So, for example, in one study, um, you may remember the. I wrote down the authors' names, Carvalho and Gabriel. Um, <clears throat> what they had is they had participants come in and do a number of things. First, they, uh, you know, wrote a little bit about their own, or not wrote, but provided uh, ratings of their own personality. They then saw uh, the personality ratings of three other people, okay? Uh, and they were told um, or some of them were told that they would then rank order, you know, which of the three people they would most like most like to interact with, and they were uh, people in that condition were also told that the others would do the same with them. Okay, and people in a control condition weren't told anything about ranking participants or uh, others ranking them. They then were told that whoever they, they they were told to rank them, the ones who were told to rank them were told to rank them from the one they would like to interact with the most, and they. Would, uh, and they might get to interact with that individual in a later task to the one they'd like to interact with the least. And then whoever was ranked the highest by all four people 
the three fake people and the participant um, would get to choose first. Okay, so then the people in that condition who were told about the ranking and uh, they were told that, hey, you were chosen as the person who most people, you were ranked highest among most people. So they're accepted. Okay, And then again, you had, they had the control condition where nobody was told anything about ranking anybody. Then they told them, before we do this task with the other participant, because again, remember the accepted person who, were told, who was told that they were ranked the highest among most people, they could choose somebody to work with. But they said, before you, go to, you, before you perform the task with them, we want you to fill out a couple measures. So they performed a mood measure, a, a, a state self-esteem measure, and a attachment style measure. Okay. Now, if avoidant individuals don't care, about whether or not people accept them, then the fact that they were rejected, or not rejected, but accepted, should be irrelevant for them. They, they should receive no boost in mood because they were ranked to be the one most people wanted to work, uh, work with the most. But avoidant individuals, just like the others, when ranked the highest, had the highest mood, so the most positive mood, and had the, mo the most positive self-esteem. So even the people who say and act like they don't care whether other people include them. Do. Okay. Um, even when being excluded is financially beneficial, okay, people still prefer um, to not be rejected. So, for example, in a study by, by Van, Beest and, Van, Van Beest and Williams, it might be best, it's B E E S D. We'll say Van Beest because that sounds cool. Uh, Van Beest and Williams, um, and if any commenters know exactly how it's pronounced, comment. Um, but anyway, um, in their study, they had uh, participants in either a loss condi condition or a gain condition. But we're just going to focus on the loss condition. In the loss condition, they were given six euros and told and told they were going to play the cyberball game, and that every time they were thrown the ball by the other two avatars, they would lose fifty euro cents. So for them, it's better to not get the ball. It's better to be excluded. So <clears throat> uh, some participants had uh, experienced inclusion, so they were thrown the ball, and some participants were uh, experienced exclusion. So after a little while, they were the two avatars quit throwing the ball to them. So you have the inclusion and exclusion condition. Of course, in the inclusion condition, it was they lost more money. They had less remaining of that six euros than did the people in the excluded condition. So the people in the excluded condition had a financial advantage or benefit of being excluded. And yet, when measuring their mood after the task, the people who had been excluded had more negative mood. So even though exclusion was beneficial for them, it hurt. Okay. So even so, even if even if you say you don't care, even if it's beneficial, social exclusion hurts. Okay. And how do we react to social exclusion? Well, it depends on the kind of exclusion. So social exclusion can occur by either being rejected or being ignored. Okay. And depending on whether you're rejected or ignored, um, you will act you will respond differently. So if you've been rejected, people tend to engage in prevention uh, or become prevention focused. So they tend to engage in prevention uh, focused actions like being vigilant against further rejection, um, <coughs> regretting uh, things that they might have done um, uh, in this circumstance, potentially things they might have done to be rejected. Uh, whereas people who are ignored tend to have to adopt a promotion focus. They tend to engage in promotion focused action. So they tend to uh, become eager to reestablish social contact. And if they regret things, they regret what they uh, uh, didn't do. Okay, Things they could have done to uh, be more accepted, to not be socially excluded. Okay. All right, guys, that's all on my list here of things to talk about, about social exclusion. Um, a little bit longer than my attachment video, sorry about that, but I hope that uh, it's informative. But if you have any questions, per the use, uh, send them my way, and I'll try to get back to you just as soon as I can. All right, guys, take it easy.